Number five is my reread every January. It's called From Anxiety to Meltdown. It is my favorite book to understand sensory meltdowns, behavior meltdowns, and tantrums. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sue Larky podcast. As I always say, you have to embrace difference to make a difference. Let's dive into today's podcast. Well, hello, everybody. Today, I want to talk through the top 10 books and tools that I think every home and school needs. We are all so busy and so often it's overwhelming. You get on a website, you don't know where to start. I thought, well, I want to save you some time and tell you the top 10 tools that I think will make a difference to you and where to start if you're new or if you already have lots of resources, you can sort of tick them off and go, got it, got it, got it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm at the airport, I love it in the bookshop when they have like the top 10 books out and I can go read it, read it. Oh, haven't read that one. Now, I am hoping to see a lot more of you this year. I'm going on tour. I'm calling it a Making a Difference Tour. And I hope you can join me on the Making a Difference Tour. There will be a live virtual too, even if you can't see me face to face. I'm thinking I might get a tour t-shirt. I am super excited. I'm super excited that I'm going to get to see all of you and have fun doing some face-to-face workshops and live virtuals. And I don't know, I just want to make it fun this year. I think we're all a bit tired by the end of last year and I want to be refreshed and fun and um, get together and do these things and run workshops and um, do these things like, you know, um, talk to each other and get energy from each other. So that's what I'm looking forward to or I get energized by seeing you. Um, Anyway, I love going into bookshops and seeing what's there. So I thought I'd create my top 10 tools or books that I think would make a difference to you and the kids you know. And I thought today's episode's like a virtual bookshop, me showing you the top 10 books and tools that I recommend everybody needs at home and school. Now, Of course, I could recommend all my books and all of my books I wrote for a reason because there was nothing like my book. So, for example, um, if you're with the early years or secondary, when I wrote those books, there was nothing around and my books are time savers. Remember, strategies wear out and not every strategy works for everybody. So I would recommend you get your early years book and you go, okay, got that one, got that one. Okay, I want to teach the child to wait this year. So what strategies is Sue recommending? Oh, tried that one. Mm, I did that one. It wore out. Remember, strategies wear out. Oh, there's a good one to try. So I always have 10 or more ideas. And the books I'm recommending today aren't just one solution. Because remember, to know someone with autism spectrum is not to know autism spectrum. Every child is an individual. Every student's an individual, as are children on the spectrum. So we need diverse strategies for diverse learners. So I am going to recommend only one of my books, but if you don't own any of my books, oh, two of my books, actually, if you don't, I've written like 16 books. If you're looking for a specific book and not sure where to start, say sensory, then I'd look at my practical sensory book. Or if you're looking for a book um, for, I'm trying to, oh, well, I'm going to talk about the social skills, but um, early years, look at the early childhood or primary, making a success. So there's so many books on my website. If you're a teacher assistant, the red and blue teacher assistant books are great for all ages and stages. So if you don't have any of my my books. I would love that you have as a goal to get one of my books this year. Now, as always, we will send the books on to you on approval. If you're in a school, you can get the books sent and have a look at them. And in fact, I'm hoping to have an order form that goes with this podcast so you can just tick off the ones you want and hopefully on the website the books will be on the blog and podcasts and you can just go off along and tick the ones you want to go in the cart to make it easy for you. And then just just choose to have them sent on approval. Now you have to pay the postage back, but it's a great way to have a look because often when you take the books and put them out in the staff room, people are like, oh, I've got that one. And I don't want you to waste your budget on books you've already got in the school. So I highly recommend in 2023, you have a look at your professional library and have a think, what can you add to your library? What tools do you need? What do you need to help to help the students? 
What are the resources that are going to make a difference and also save you time and stress, often knowing what to do when you have neurodiverse students? Now, some people with their NDIS or NDIA package can buy books if they're for their child. And I recommend if your school doesn't have a budget, you should actually buy the books, put your name on them, and then every year re-give them to the staff. So the first two books I'm going to recommend are actually uh, three, four, okay, well, most of these books, parents, I would recommend. So you share them with teachers and staff at to support your children because teachers are busy. So you want to help them and even put some sticky notes in the pages that help support your child. You know your child best, but if you give a teacher a massive book, that might be helpful, but you might go, hey, here's a couple of pages you might find helpful. So um, I'll explain a little bit more as we go along, but as you can hear, I'm a little bit excited. See, I love books. So the first book I'm going to recommend, if you don't have any of my books, the one bestseller, The Ultimate Guide to School and Home, the one with the key on the front that I wrote with Anna Tullamans. And I know you've all heard me say this before, but when a parent and a teacher write a book together, it's like the perfect relationship because Anna would go, well, I just do this at home. And I'd go, well, how's that going to work at school? And I'd go, well, I do this at school. And she goes, if you do that at school, he's exhausted when he gets home and that doesn't work at home. So we've put in the book, the stuff that works for both of us. And nearly every page has like 10 to 15 strategies. So for example, one of the ones that I often point out when I'm in in schools is um, 50% of children with ASD are left-handers. But most people go, oh, left-handed scissors. Yeah, no, it's not about the left-handed scissors. It's about positioning of the child. It's about giving them space to turn their book side on so that they can write side on. It's about using a 2B pencil, not a HB pencil. Go and have a look at your school's um list, their book list for this year. Guaranteed they have HB pencils, which are for right-handers. So it's a biased book list. You know, so often the book lists, they don't say to parents, oh, uh, left-handers need a HB pencil. And the reason for that, a 2B pencil, HB pencils are are stronger lead. And when you write across the page, whereas with a left-hander, they have to push across the page. That's why they get holes in their page. Also, schools often have pens on their page. Well, my son's a left-hander and we actually had to spend a lot of time when he was in year 11 and 12 finding pens that didn't smudge for him during um, exams. And when he was younger, I always got him those rub-out pens and they come in all colours. They're fantastic. So this is why I'm saying it's not just books, it's tools we need to think about too. So For me, in the ultimate guide, Anna and I have so many time savers and tips like that. So, for example, in the essential guide to secondary, and I'm pretty sure it's in the ultimate too, we talk about um, instead of the kids having a lot of separate books, maybe just using one book for all their work. Because remember, executive functioning is such, they're probably going to lose things. So how do we change the structure, not the child? Just have one book for everything. It doesn't matter. That's an accommodation. For those of you in schools, it's up to us to accommodate and adjust children who learn differently. And one of them could be just all books, all work is in one book, or not asking them to paste things into their books in the younger years and having a plastic sleeve that they put everything in. There's so many ways that we can make it easier for our students and ourselves, can I say? Because a kid who struggles sensory-wise with a glue stick, let's just avoid the glue stick. You know, there's so many things we can do. Okay, so the ultimate guide to school and home, I think all of you should have that on your bookshelf, available, have it for 500 strategies, everything from early years and diagnosis right through to getting your driver's license. It's got everything in that book. So that's the number one one you need. The second book is my absolute carry round in my teaching basket, the behavior solutions um, for the inclusive classroom. Now, it doesn't matter if you are with a three-year-old an eight-year-old, a 13-year-old, or a 17-year-old, you are going to have children who hum. So you're going to need strategies. It doesn't matter if you're a three, 13, 18-year-old, you're going to have kids who don't like wearing shoes and socks. So I love, love, love that book because when I open that book, it has really good ideas. And again, not just one solution, quite a few solutions. 
And most importantly, one of the collaborators is an occupational therapist, Beth, who I've had on the podcast. And she has put in there all the things parents would come to her with, all the problems that their children were facing in inclusive classrooms and turn them not into problems, but solutions, what we can do. But because she's an occupational therapist, I've often thought of the classroom teacher structure changes, but she often addresses the sensory. So a child humming might actually need a chewy object, you know? So who would have thought? Or a movement break. So have a look in that book. It is such a book, great book. I love it um, because so often people put me on the spot and go, Sue, what should I do? I open that book, boom, try this, this, this. Because often I think of one or two of the ideas, but there's another five in there. So the other reason I love this book, sometimes it's just nice to know you're on the right track. Go, I'm doing it, doing it, doing it. You know what? I am actually doing a lot already because I am guilty of always thinking, what more can I do? What more can I do? And sometimes I just need to reflect and think about all I am doing. So highly recommend Behaviour Solutions for the Inclusive Classroom. There are three in the series, but I would start with the first one. The next book I'd recommend is Tony Atwood's. And you know, I I do workshops with Tony and you can do his course on my um, website. And I highly recommend if you've done my course and want to learn more this year, do Tony Atwood's course. It is fantastic. Tony is a psychologist. So he's a psychologist doing the why does this child do, do that? Like why? What is the psychology? And then I'm the what to do. None of our courses overlap, but they complement each other. So Tony will talk about the psychology of why children don't like making mistakes. I'll give you the solutions, what to do with children who don't like making mistakes. So that's the way I'd explain it. Tony will tell you the psychology of children need time to process. I will give you the solutions in a busy classroom for children who need more time to process. So that's how I explain it. Tony's the why and I'm the what to do. So Tony has two books. One is for under seven-year-olds, I'd look at the one with the purple cover um, that's called Asperger's Syndrome, okay, for parents and professionals. But the book every school needs is The Complete Guide to Asperger's, which is the one with the shell on the front. It is like the encyclopedia of ASD. So, so often I go to email Tony. I'll go, oh, I need to ask Tony or someone else send me a question for Tony. I just get out his book and boom, there is the answer. But always start at the back at the reference pages and then turn to the front of the book. So if you want to know about bullying, have a read, go to that. If you want to know about diagnosis, Go, um, he always says, like, if you know someone who you think is an adult, maybe should get a diagnosis, get them to read chapter one. They'll often self-diagnose. So that's a really good chapter to read chapter one. And then use it as a reference. So just like if you want to know more about girls, read that section. If you want to know more about um, emotional regulation and um, the toolbox that Tony has created, just look it up in the back. But guaranteed, there's like, I think, 20 reference pages because there's so much in that book. So I highly recommend The Complete Guide. Now, Tony calls it The Complete Guide. I call it The Complex Guide because ASD is complex. And this book shows the complexity. It is a fat book. Do not try and read it from front to back. I would recommend just look up the one section and read the bit that's of interest to you that resonates with the kids you know because so much of the book wouldn't be relevant until you meet someone where that topic is relevant. So you might have children who want friends or a job um, or who uh, is addicted to their screen. Just read that section. So that is number three. Number four is the fine motor flip book. Now the reason for that is I am seeing children with the worst fine motor skills I have ever seen in schools And so many of my children get frustrated because they can't open their chips or they can't cut or they can't draw and they definitely get in the can't, can't, I can't do it, this is boring, I I don't know how to colour. They get frustrated when they colour outside the lines. So many things that they get frustrated with that has to do with fine motor. Now, I did not learn this when I was at uni and I'm sure many of you didn't know this. But actually, to have good fine motor, you've got to have good core because the child's body develops from 
core out. So if you think a baby learns to roll first before they can pick up a spoon. So a baby learns gross motor before fine motor. So the motor flip book, sorry, it's not called the fine motor flip book. I call it that. The motor flip book has activities to develop your core and gross motor to help your fine motor. Too many people just focus on the fine motor and not the gross motor. So teachers, this book is amazing. I know you're going to have kids in year five who still need help with this. You're going to have kids who are going into year 11 and 12 and need help with fine motor, particularly if they've been online and on their computers. Just get your hands out and pretend you're typing. Now put your fingers in a pincer grip. So many of my kids have lost their strength, their pincer grip, because they've been typing or on their iPad that's only one finger. Just try that. Go iPad, one finger, typing, lots of fingers, or maybe one finger too. And then hold a pencil or a pen. You need three fingers working together. But even more complex, you need to be able to track. You need to be able to look and write down. Whereas on your computer, everything's in front of you. So teachers, I recommend you, it's a little flip, it's a flip book. It's fantastic. I recommend you set up stations to do the flip books or get your teacher assistants or angels to take them out to do the activities or do them as a whole class. So many great things, but even more importantly, the kids love them. It's really good fun and they see improvement quickly in their motor skills. So highly recommend that book for all ages and stages. Number five is my reread every January. It's called From Anxiety to Meltdown. It is my favorite book to understand sensory meltdowns, behavior meltdowns, and tantrums. Any of you who've done my course, it is the book that underpins the last session of the day when I talk about what's the difference between a behavior meltdown, sensory meltdown, and tantrum. Those of you who've done my online course, module five. So This is, I I spend, you know, an hour and a half, two hours explaining this to you. What is the difference? It's so important because so many people collapse behavior all into one thing. If nothing else this year, can you make sure you have three different behavior plans? Sensory meltdown, behavior meltdown, and tantrum. You can't collapse them because they're very different. Anyway, I love this book. It is the easiest read. You will read it in an hour and a half, two hours, but what I love, you'll keep going back to it. So although you'd go, oh, I've forgotten, like say $40 really for a book I'm going to read in an hour and a half, two hours, you will go back to it so often. It's like the best reference. Um, I The first time I read it, I was on a plane and the plane landed in Brisbane. I'll never forget. And I'm like, I don't want to get off. I'm like, really want to finish this book. And I literally read it between Sydney and Brisbane. Such a good book. If you haven't read it, please put it on your must read this year. So it's called From Anxiety to Meltdown. Parents, game changer. Uh, you must read it, parents um, and carers. Highly recommend it for every age group. Number six is, oh, kids in the syndrome mix. This is probably more for teachers, um, our preschool too and, and early years. I'm getting more and more kids with letters after their names and, you know, it's quite confusing and we didn't learn about all of these things like ODD and PDA and even ADHD, our understandings change. So I love this book, Kids in the Syndrome Mix because it really demystifies what each of those diagnoses mean. And you could write buy a book on each of those diagnoses, but actually just having one book that explains all the different syndromes, really, really helpful. So it's got everything from Tourette's to ODD, really good book, Kids in the Syndrome Mix. So really what does that syndrome mean is what that book's about. So I highly recommend that one. Number seven is my book, Developing Social Skills. Now, a little bit of an explanation here. A lot of people on the spectrum are saying at the moment, hey, we don't need to develop social skills. We don't need social skills. You know, that's unfair. We see and engage differently. And I agree with that. My book, Developing Social Skills, is to be done with the whole class or the whole family. Because what I learned, there is no point taking a group of children out and teaching them about taking turns or what to do if someone says they won't play with you. And the rest of the class haven't learned about it. 
and how to respond and how to support a child with ASD. Social skills is two ways. There's no point me sitting in my bedroom learning social skills. I actually have to go and engage with other people. But other people have to support me and my way of engaging. Just like, you know, I have my own social needs. Like some people like I might like a big group of people, some might like one-on-one. We're all different. Everyone has different social skills. So that was why this book's called Developing Social Skills. But the aim is this. They're just five or 10-minute activities you can do with the whole class. So if you're having children constantly dobbing or um, coming in, going so-and-so and not solving problems in the playground, you can just do the worksheets and activities, 10 minutes in there. If you're having children who... All children struggle with conversations, what to talk to people about. There's a whole mind mapping on conversations there, like how to do conversation mapping. All children need these skills. So I just want to be clear, my developing social skills is for everyone. It's about everybody supporting each other socially and understanding that we're still learning social skills. It doesn't matter what age you are, you still are learning social skills. You've still had an awkward social um, situation come up, guaranteed over Christmas. There might have been an argument or, you know, someone got upset or something happened. So I highly recommend that all schools should, in primary, not secondary, have a look at my developing social skills. Again, full of hundreds of strategies. It's a really the way I do talk about it. It's um, what to teach, how to teach, ready to go. So they're just photocopyable. There's social scripts in there. There's um, playground plans in there. There's uh, a whole section on um, regulating emotions and where you feel emotions in your body. But do that with the whole family. Do that with the whole class. Everybody gets angry. Everyone gets sad. Some people, when they're angry, shut down. Some um, scream and shout. You know, some people's heart raise, some get sweaty, some cry. Let's talk about it. It takes 10 minutes as a whole class. Everybody in the class, tell me when you're angry, where do you feel it in your body? Boom, done. We've just done a social social activity. So I think all kids need that. But particularly any of you who did learning at home a lot in the last two years, so much social anxiety. So many of my children have missed that social development. So I think you're going to need that developing social skills book more than ever. So that's why I've made that number seven. Number eight is a tool every school and family needs. And that is the time timer. I know I always talk about time timers and I'm doing a whole podcast on time timers um, too, but I believe it's the number one adaption, accommodation or tool we need. If children can't access time, what do they do? Ask you, how long? When do we finish? I feel like I did it for ages. If they don't have access to time, if they don't have an accurate way to measure time, you are going to get behaviour. Because when you ask them to finish on something, they're going to say, I only just got on it. It's not fair. I didn't get a long time. Because they aren't measuring time. The reason we have watches and clocks and timers is to measure time. But I go into so many schools who have an analog clock and that is not accessible for my students. Sure, they might be able to read that says 10.30, but do they know that that means they've only got five minutes left doing something? Does that actually be accessible time? So time timers are designed for children on the spectrum. I mean, now they're used for head injuries and a whole range of different things, but they were originally designed as a visual timer to support children with autism spectrum disorder. But what makes them so special is they're always revising and updating them and the latest ones are awesome. So if you currently have what used to be called the large is now called medium, really does frustrate me. They changed the name, but the medium one is like the same size as most schools have an analog clock. What I recommend that you can either, now it's got two magnets on the back or you can still put a hook and hang it next to your clock. So Say it says 10.30 and the child's got five, they had 20 minutes on their iPad. You put the timer on for 20 minutes, the child can visually see how long they've got left. But even better, now they come with a little card on the top. And I believe children need to know what they're going to do when they're finished. So you put a picture of what they're doing next so they can see, I've got 20 minutes on my iPad 
and then I'm doing my handwriting task. I've got 20 minutes on my iPad, then I'm going outside. I've got 20 minutes on my iPad and then I need to do my math. So I recommend the visual on top of the timer is what they're doing next, not what they're doing now. They already know what they're doing now, you know, and I love the now, next, later. And in the ultimate guide to school and home, the number one book I recommended, we have one page which has now, next, later, and an amazing explanation by Anna on real choices. And I highly recommend if you have that book, go back and have a read of that, get your now, next, later visuals set up for this year. And if you're using a timer, then actually put that visual of what they're doing. So now they're on the iPad, next they're doing maths, later they're going back on the iPad or outside, whatever. But make sure you use those visuals on the new timers. It's a little whiteboard and you can draw on it but or you can, you know, blue tack on. It's fantastic. Number 10, The Red Beast. I love the book, The Red Beast. It is fantastic. Now, I've put it at number nine because not all of you will have children who get angry. But any of the books in of K, so there's The Red Beast, The Panicosaurus for Anxiety, there's the uh, Winston the Wallaby, the ADHD book. There's about six in the series. I would recommend you choose one of the books in the, that series. So not all of you are going to want The Red Beast, but I would recommend uh, The Disappointment Dragon. Whatever emotions your students really need some support with, I highly recommend those books. Now, Kay uses a metaphor. So children don't have to take things personally, that they understand the red beast. And she's such a clever teacher and person. And the way she uses the red beast and all of the Panicosaurus and the Winston the Wallaby, make sure you read the teaching notes. Parents and schools, everyone needs this book. Now, the reason I love this book and these books is because they help the other children be supportive. They help the other children understand that everyone gets angry, everyone gets anxious, but some children need a little bit more support and understanding. And the other thing I like about the book, it addresses, well, why didn't that child get in trouble for having a meltdown? And that's, you know, that they get to go and use their sensory tools. And so often children want to know why. And these books really help children understand why. Now, some people will go, oh, but my child will say, I didn't do it. My red beast did it. That's okay. That's a developmental stage. They're actually protecting their ego. But over time, they will start to use the strategies and understand it's their red beast. And even better, Kay has revised and updated the Red Beast. It's got whole new illustrations. Some of you might have listened to the podcast last year with Kay where she explained why she changed the book and how she's tried to help children understand the metaphor. It is, I think she sold over 50,000 copies, which is amazing. It is a best-selling book and I'm sure lots of you have it. I do recommend you get the new edition. There's lots of reasons it's more inclusive. It really covers diversity more. And if you listen to that podcast where she explains it, it will make sense. So make sure that you get one of Kay's books this year. It doesn't have to be The Red Beast. It could be any of her books. I am a fan of all of them. And the last one is I Am Aspie Girl. I would love every school to have I Am Aspie Girl. And the reason for that is so many of our girls are underdiagnosed. I actually recommend that you read it as a staff meeting. Read it to the whole staff meeting and discuss the girls who maybe haven't been getting a diagnosis. The previous diagnosis was a boy bias. So it actually diagnosed boys because that's all they looked at. The new diagnosis, the DSM-5, it's not so new now, but the latest diagnosis actually realized that it didn't have enough girls in the um, criteria. So the girls are different. And I have got a whole podcast on that with Januta, when she's the psychologist who wrote I Am Aspie Girl. So I'll link to that in the podcast, but highly recommend if you want to know more about the girls, listen to that podcast. It's like what clinical psychologist Danuta wishes you knew about girls. And she wrote this book, I Am Aspie Girl, and I love it. Not only do I love it, the girls on the spectrum love it 
And I find their friends and peers are far more supportive if they understand. So again, it's educating the neurotypical children to support the neurodiverse children. Um, Most of my girls who have Aspie read this book and just find it reassuring that they are an Aspie girl. I also recommend you follow Yellow Ladybugs if you want to understand more about the girls. But obviously, I've got a whole podcast on that. So have a listen. So that is the 10 books that I recommend that you consider having in your personal or your school library. If you've got a budget this year, one in a hundred kids are diagnosed on the spectrum. We need to make sure we have access to the right tools and resources for staff. Parents, I highly recommend you pick which of these books would make a difference to you and your children. But books like Red Beast, you should be able to claim under your NDIS because it's to help your child. So I highly recommend that you think about what are the things I need to support the children? And I know you could Google this, but you'll spend hours on Google. Why not just pick up a book by a world expert? Tony Atwood's book is a best-selling book in the world on Asperger's. It sold like, I don't know, 200,000 copies or more. Why Google what is Asperger's when you can learn from a world expert? If you want to know about um, meltdowns, read from meltdown, from anxiety to meltdown, the best book on it. So I highly recommend that we, I know it sounds old fashioned, but we go back to some good old reading um, of books that give us the tips and understanding and strategies, but also let us know we're on the right track. Sometimes I'm on Google because I'm like, oh, what else do I need to know? And the truth is those answers are probably on my bookshelf already, but I can't help but be like, oh, what more? I think this year, let's just stop, reflect, take a moment to look what we're already doing, add on a few more things, but let's not overwhelm ourselves too much. So I know I have just recommended 10 books and tools, but it's highly likely you've already got some, already using them. So it's just an opportunity to add a couple more to your professional library or your personal library. So remember, embrace difference to make a difference. And the best way to embrace difference is to understand and support children who learn and engage differently. And resources are a fabulous way to do that. I hope you've got some great tips and strategies to make a difference. Remember, strategies wear out and not every strategy works for everybody. If you're ready to dive in deeper to more strategies and ideas to make a difference, I'd highly recommend you consider Dr. Tony Atwood or my online courses. For more information, visit my website, www.sulaki.com.au.